Hello and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. Pushpendra Mehta, Executive Writer at CTM File. We are delighted to welcome back Bob Stark, Global Head of Market Strategy at Kariba and Craig Jeffrey, Managing Partner and Strategic Treasurer for today's episode. Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us on topics that impact corporate treasury. Bob and Craig, it's time to get some deeper insights from you on our themes for today, namely Payments, open banking processing, seeing U.S. economy, resignation and layoffs, contagion and liquidity planning. Listeners of this podcast can read these articles and also review a variety of treasury content by visiting ctmfile.com or by following the links in our show notes. Let's start our discussion with payments. Amazon and Stripe are expanding their corporate partnership and under the new agreement, Stripe will become a strategic payments partner for Amazon in the US, Europe and Canada, processing a significant portion of Amazon's total payments volume. Payments lie at the heart of global commerce and digital economy. Bob, what do you think of the Amazon Stripe partnership in terms of its impact on corporations and treasury? The first thing I noticed when I saw this story was, well, congratulations, Stripe. I mean, Amazon's a big name. Everybody wants to have that as their anchor client. So uh, that was the first thing I saw. But in reality, this is more about Amazon than it is about Stripe. Just the fact we're talking about it plays into what Amazon does really well is, is create publicity around some sort of market offering that they have to support, in this case, payments and B2B payments. There's a couple of different things. I mean, you look at the the article, I read it through just to make sure I understood all the words. There's a couple of different product placements within that um, within that announcement. Those are things that none of us ever even thought about. Like, did I think about a Gravitron chip line? Did I think about Nitro Enclaves within their AWS hosting? No. But the moment that you're in the B2B landscape, the moment that you're a payment processor, you're looking at this and thinking, hmm, if I'm not working with AWS, maybe I should be because Stripe is. So that's the beauty of this at, at first blush. The second part in terms of applicability is that it really does showcase the amount of energy and obviously market share and money that comes from being a payments provider and payment processing. And this is a significant industry. There's Stripe makes a tremendous amount of its revenue based on payment process and specifically card payments. It's not the only thing they do, but it's a big part of it. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to grow and to really make a name for itself and dominate a space which is continuing to increase. So what does it mean for corporate treasury? Well, for those organizations that actually have any sort of payment acceptance, that are looking to somehow create efficiencies around how they accept payments, either lower cost or have more scalability, then they might look at Stripe and go, well, they serve Amazon, so they can probably help us too. Similarly, for those that are on the fintech side, I think this is a more interesting one. If you're looking to innovate, you're probably looking to emulate some of the things that Stripe did with Amazon and be able to pick and choose those things to say, hey, we do that too. Our service is just as secure as Stripe is because we use the same cloud infrastructure within Amazon Web Services. So I think it's more of a, as a fintech in the payment space, I think you're pretty interested in very reading intently and maybe drilling down and doing a little bit more Google searches around what does Amazon do that I don't know about. That's probably the biggest takeaway that I would uh, that I would garner from this. I like your comments there, Bob. Um, you know, on the marketing side, who would have who would have talked about nitro enclaves? I mean, we we might think from a business perspective when you're talking about payments, um, scalability and security are really important, mm-hmm. and the cloud native environment. You know, AWS, Amazon Web Services, Azure, Google Cloud, all support some of that scalability. And, and here's some of the 
the breakouts on the, you know, you have an enclave that's a, a protected, you know, firewalled off area that runs different from more secure transactions. So I think this is, this is part of the, we all have to understand security at different levels from an architecture standpoint, um, from a, you know, not, you know, the hardware, software, operating model and structures. As a follow-up, can I ask you another question, Bob? Um, you know, on your outlook for payments in 2023, there are six areas in payments, namely real-time payments, cross-border B2B payments, central bank digital currency, embedded payments, digital wallets, and buy now, pay later. Uh, these are expected to influence the payments and treasury landscape in 2023. Of these six areas, which according to you will impact or influence payments and corporate treasury the most? All right. Well, just for fun, I'm going to pick two, just because choosing one of those is actually pretty difficult. I'm going to start with real time payments, not necess- not as the trademark, like not as necessarily TCH in, in the United States, but more as like the instant, faster payments continuum. There's a lot of space for that, especially in corporate B2B payments. I mean, you think from a treasury standpoint, we looked at AFP last year, there was a tremendous amount of conversation around. How do I prepare for instant payments? How do I actually utilize APIs? So there's a lot of interest in this area. The fact that the product um, in terms of faster payments, instant payments is starting to proliferate, not just in the United States with say TCH and then FedNow, even same day ACH could be part of that conversation, but we're starting to see these networks not just pop up and start to gain more B2B adoption elsewhere in the world, but we're also seeing some connective tissue between networks. And so I very much expect that this very, this concept of fast payments or even faster than we are today will continue to be just part of the conversation, almost like the expected part of the conversation. There's very few investments we made in B2B payments that aren't running at a pace that's quicker than what we see now. And a lot of that's driven by FedNow in the US for sure. Um, But in other countries, they have their own versions of both private and we'll say more government sponsored activity. So I think that's a big one. But in the rest of your list, the one that pops out to me are embedded payments, embedded finance. This is the one that will continue to drive significant amounts of innovation and payments. And the simple reason, and you know, we talked briefly about this with with Stripe, if Stripe's going to have a play in, say, corporate finance, corporate B2B payments, payment acceptance, and they obviously play in merchant services, e-commerce, and things like that very prominently now, as they continue to go upstream into larger organizations, they're going to be embedded and part of other services. And that disintermediation that has come from things like open banking drive that opportunity for payments to be not necessarily as front and center, but part of a package of services and offerings from technology companies, from banks, even from other players that weren't as prominent before open banking started to become a reality. I mean, I think that fits well into this concept of, you know, payments are almost always seen as, hey, we do some kind of transaction and then we have to go execute the payments and it becomes a a big process. And the more that gets minimized, you know, through things like, uh, you know, tech, you know, APIs, embedded treasury, embedded payments, it becomes almost a non-issue. It's like behind the scenes. And that's really a good thing. It's like the less, the less we think about payments, the less the transaction is about payments, the better the payment experience, the, the better the business experience is. So it's the better you do, the less it becomes noticeable. The next story that merits discussion is about US-based bank payments processing API provider Wafi launching Wafi.cash for open banking payments in e-commerce. The new payment processing platform is expected to provide simple APIs for bank payment processing in a better way and cuts down redundant entities from payment processing. Despite advancements in technology and payment processing, Fraud, identity theft, high fees, and inconsistent user experiences plague corporations. Do you think there is a significant opportunity for improvement in this space because of open banking payments processing? There's always a significant opportunity when you have so much money at stake. And if you look at Wafi's one of many, and and I'm not going to say they're exceptional or (laughs) anything, but there's certainly 
a good provider that's starting to make a name for themselves as one of many that play in this, we'll just call it payment acceptance space. You know, a number of different payment channels. They're trying to play in that multi-channel, omni-channel type of payments game. And a big part of their service is just like we were talking about Stripe a moment ago, is around cart because there's so much room in those fees for everyone to have their little pound of flash. And what that really means is that, yes, their proposition, they're going to go in saying, we can reduce your cost of acceptance. We can reduce the amount of money it takes to accept the customer payment and make that a much more efficient experience. And that overall is a good proposition. Anyone that can streamline that and start to really provide some additional services, such as reducing things like error process and error handling, being able to deal with a reduced amount of fraud, which are all prevalent in these types of payments, especially on the card side. We we know that everyone that's in this infrastructure, the way that they try and do things is to offer maybe a lower percentage in terms of that total cost of acceptance of a payment, and then similarly offer some value-added services through things like AI and other types of technologies embedded within their payment structure. So there's room for, for them as well as a variety of other players in this space. The point that Craig and I were making a moment ago around like embedded payments, embedded finance, those sorts of things, most corporate treasury teams will probably never run across an organization like this directly. They will see it embedded within a series of services that's provided from a larger provider, provided from the banking provider. And yes, there's room for all of that because there's a need for more efficiency. There's a need for lower cost, and there's certainly a need for improved security. You can always get better at each of those things. The bigger part of this story, as, as I read through it, is, is not so much that they've you know, cut out some of the, the middleman type fees. And, and there's there's a lower cost, so that's always always important. The other the other part is this this ongoing story of uh, how do we use technology to to identify anomalies or defects. And so there's anomalies or defects, processing errors, and payments. That's massively expensive for organizations to fix those items. So the sooner they can be detected, the sooner they can be corrected, holds significant value. So error handling, routing them at the earliest point possible is always a good story. And the same thing with the fraud detection. This is a, a big, big use of uh, anomaly detection. You know, you detect patterns and things outside the pattern. That can be fraud. That can be errors. This is just a, a good use. That's the general theme for the business person that we're using these types of technology, not just APIs to make it efficient, not just business composition or uh, uh, groupings that that eliminate some of the fees, but we're leveraging that technology to drive out the significant issues to scale and and quality. The third story for today is about um, a story published on CDM file titled Expect a U.S. Slow Session Instead of Recession. Christian D. Ritis, Moody's Analytics Deputy Chief Economist, coined the term slow session, which is when economic growth grinds to a new halt, but a full or protracted economic downturn is avoided. As the world's ablest business strategists, CFOs, corporate treasurers, and economists publicize their views on whether the U.S. is in recession, headed for a recession, or expected to escape recession in 2023, and what is going to happen to the to global recession in different parts of the world? Moody's analytics says the more likely near time scenario is not a flow full blown recession in the U.S., but rather a slow session because of easing inflation and strong economic fundamentals that point to a more likely so session. 34 recessions have occurred in the U.S. since 1854, according to the U.S. based National Bureau of Economic Research. Bob, last year, CFOs, strategists, business leaders, corporate treasurers had to face a cavalcade of challenges because of inflation, interest rate risks, market volatility, and host of other factors. Do you think um, some of those challenges are going to linger into 2023? And is the US and different parts of the world, are they headed for a recession or will we escape it? Yeah. So let me start by saying thank you, Moody's, for creating a brand new word for us to deal with. 
<laughs> uh, slow session. Craig and I were laughing about this before that we didn't need that word to really describe some of the perspective uh, outlooks that may or may not happen in 2023. I think the reality is that there's a possibility that things slow down. I mean, inflation is still higher than it should be in the U.S., certainly in other parts of the world. I mean, the U.K. is about to see probably another 100 basis points of increases in the relatively near future. ECB is looking at the same thing and other regions the same. So recession may be an outcome of those interest rate hikes. I mean, that's what the Fed has been careful to try and avoid broadcasting fairly far forward the expectations around here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, here's what we're trying to achieve with that. And the whole reason why that matters is that not to avoid words like slow session, which irritate me mildly, but <laughs> more to try to maintain some level of growth without slipping on the wrong side of that and actually going into receding growth and decelerating too much. So, uh, you know, your question around, is there a lot of uncertainty in the economy in 2023? Well, as we record this, we're a month into 2023 and the answer is, yep, so far there is. You know, we've seen, if we just look at currency markets just to start with, which I think are indicative of what's happening in terms of a variety of expectations in the market, never mind the fact of interest rates being used to try and calm some of those fears, that we see the euros return to where it was in May of last year before its giant slide back below parity. These are examples of the uncertainty that's going on in the market. Yet, if you look at just the headwinds or tailwinds from a currency standpoint, that doesn't tell the picture. It's the volatility behind that. An indicator that I follow a lot is the FX VIX, just to look at what's the volatility going on in currency markets. That's indicative of a lot of different things. It, in the past month, has been just as high as it was at its worst points in September, October, when the euro was sliding, dollar was gaining strength against everything because of obviously the interest rate hikes that have been happening in the States. So the point being is that there's a lot of things that are still unknown. And in that same Moody's article, they provide a couple of different graphs they published on CTM file. The second one, not the bar chart one, but I'm going to call it like the, we'll call it the, the quadrant type one. There's a lot of different factors in there, which I always look at to say how many of these items, these risk factors are going to occur that are, that's the difference between, yes, it's going to be okay versus mm, we got a problem. And it's everything from what's happening in China. You know, the Chinese economy obviously is continuing to open up, but yet they close themselves down from a coronavirus standpoint. Seems like a very smart decision in their standpoint. They're able to keep going, but we don't know what next looks like from that standpoint. We don't know what it looks like in terms of interest rates that are needed to corral the inflation. We don't know if there's any sort of uncertainty from a political standpoint in Europe that may take the next step. I mean, all you know, oil has to do is go way above where it is now to trigger a next wave of inflation, which kind of the stuff we saw in 2022. So there's a lot of factors at play that you could argue are interrelated, but certain triggers can set off a domino effect, which can mean the difference between, and I hate to say the word slow session, let's just say a slower rate of growth versus something that's actually retreating growth and actually decelerating economies and end up to a bad place. So it's a, I'm not fully answering your question because we don't know exactly what next looks like, but we do know that there is a series of factors that can trigger domino effects, either positively or negatively at this point. I definitely agree with Bob that that second chart with more than a dozen, you know, risk factors that are are broken out between severity of risk and likelihood of risk. I mean, there's uh, it'd be hard put, I'd be hard pressed to say, well, we don't expect at least four or five of these to occur. And those are all, those can all be, uh, you know, a damaging in some way. Um, I have probably have a stronger feeling than Bob about, you know, I think he was mildly annoyed about the, uh, the term slow session. I mean, it's like we have good terms like slow growth or stagnant economy. We have those terms and they describe it perfectly. It's one thing back, I think in the eighties, they came up with the term stagflation. Well, stagnant growth and inflation. Well, that was a new way of putting two words together that we hadn't really seen before. And so there was a way of putting slow growth and inflation. Usually it's high growth and high inflation. Let's just call it slow growth. Um, I know we want to coin words, you know, just like 
in the uh, regular environment. Goblin mode was one of the words of 2022. And it's like, okay, that's not a word. That's not one word. It's two words. And so that was a bit of a peeve of mine, but and it's like, oh, behaving like a, a monster with, you know, just being a complete slob uh, is like, okay, there's a way of it describes something. So I, I don't think slow session cuts it uh, slow growth. The I- idea from a treasure perspective is we have to be risk managers, be mindful of what goes on. And so that feeds into some of our later discussion about how do we look at what the future holds from a forecast perspective, because there's variability there. And so this, there's, there's quite a, a bit of really good information in this article despite the unfortunate wording um, that, that comes with it. Our fourth story for today is about turnover contagion, induced, uh, which has been induced by the great resignation that began early 2021 to the mass layoffs that starting in 2022 and continue. Now, a new data-backed research study by the workforce analytics company Vizier suggests that resignations and layoffs are contagious and more likely to result in pushing the remaining co-workers, that is those that have been able to keep their jobs out of the organization's door. The study says that smaller, more interconnected teams might perform better, but the risk of turnover contagion also increases. Given that the average corporate treasury team is small in size, uh, can you suggest, Craig, if I can ask you to go first, can you suggest a few ways they can recognize and mitigate the risk of turnover, whether it's voluntary or involuntary contagion? Yeah, so I think uh, the risk of turnover, because treasury groups are smaller, but they're they're small, uh, they tend to be growing. They're not facing the layoffs, as you see in other finance areas, uh, or as you see in in the tech sector uh, lately, some of the the 10,000 plus uh, layoffs at, at certain companies, uh, or even in banking, you know, Goldman Sachs uh, uh, as just one of several banks uh, laying off quite a few bankers. Uh, the issue, you know, what what can you what can you see and what can you do? I guess there's a couple elements, and I think we need to look at this from a, if it's not an age cohort, at least a you know, level responsibility and mindset cohort. So at the, at the very high level, corporations are seeing a uh, significant need for strong risk managers, strong leaders in treasury, and they're pulling people. So, you know, are you, um, are you helping and providing the type of experience for your treasurers and assistant treasurers to continue to grow and use that? That would be use their skills and develop their skills. That would be a key area of, of maintaining what goes on at the top level. Um, you know, giving them, uh, giving them the controls and power to do what they should be doing. Not every organization is, is as open to that. Um, sometimes it's more restrictive. And where are you going to go if you're, you know, if you're trying to develop your, you know, your portfolio of skills and if you see the needs and it's being uh, overly constrained at the earlier part of the career stage, what's a big issue? If you have very manual processes, people will leave, you know, the, you know, people that are in their 40s or 30s, your mid 30s, they're not going to leave if a process is particularly manual. They might be frustrated, but they'll stay. But the, the Zoomers who are in the market, they will not do stuff that's really manual. It's like, this is horrible. Why are we going to do this? We got to dial into, you know, five different banks, key in information. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like the Stone Age to them. They're not used to any of that. Um, and some of their frustration with doing that is, Hey, I can go somewhere else and not do that and do better things. And they do. And it makes sense to do that. Why would they stick in that place? So if you have very manual processes for core activities, you're, you're going to, you're going to face that. Um, especially if, you know, as you're trying to hire new, the new entrants of the market don't put up with that nonsense. They see it as nonsense. You can say, if you're in a different age cohort, Hey, that's okay. You know, tough it out, key it, key the stuff in. No, that, They're not going to do that. And so, you know, we're seeing that in a number of industries. We're seeing examples of that people leaving. And then it quickly becomes, we've got to automate this because we want to hire people. And they only want to work in a very automated manner that they can use more of their skills, not their keying skills, but their mental skills. I think those are a couple areas. I'm sure Bob has quite a bit more on there. Yeah, I like that, that stream of thinking because make treasury fun. Nobody wants to work in somewhere that's not fun. And you may think, okay, well, what about treasury is fun? Well, if you're in treasury, you know how fun it is. But to Craig's point, what's not interesting is trying to bring together eight different spreadsheets 
and then do some copy and pasting and a little bit of calculator on your iPhone on the side, just to try and figure out the numbers that the CFO needs in terms of looking at their cash forecast and their liquidity planning. These are the sorts of things that are going to drive people away. And I fully, fully live and breathe crazy point. I've, I've seen these kinds of things at our clients where if the moment that you say, Hey, this can be done much more easily. It's almost that sense of relief. Like, okay, that's what we were trying to get out of this. Now we can actually start doing the more interesting analyses as opposed to trying to bring data together that an API or series of APIs could do automatically. So it really comes back to providing a great work environment that people want to be a part of. If you do that, you can minimize the amount of resignations. We saw this when the labor market was very hot and there was a lot of attractive opportunities. You could argue that maybe where we are in 2023, the opportunities aren't quite as attractive, but it doesn't mean, and the data shows this, that people will stay in something that's not providing some sort of great return on the amount of time and effort that they're spending at work. So, yeah, I like that point, Craig. Interesting. If I may ask you the last question for today, liquidity planning, Bob, is extremely important uh, from a corporate treasury perspective as well as for corporations. Uh, so is cash management, so is visibility. But what intrigued me uh, is when I heard about the liquidity planning platform launched by Kariba a few months ago particularly when we live in a multiple risk scenario world. Can you tell us a little bit more about the liquidity planning platform and how it can enhance cash forecasting? What are the differentiated features? Sure. Well, I'll answer less from a product standpoint, more from a practice standpoint. So we all know what cash forecasting is. It's just projecting what is our expected cash or pluses and our minuses inflows and outflows over a period of time. In recent years, certainly since the pandemic, that forecast horizon has increased. And so a lot of treasury teams don't forecast just 13 weeks. They're out to a year, sometimes even more in partnership with FP&A. But that's just from a cash standpoint. The real exercise now has been to add different risk scenarios to understand what about this, what about that, and then look at not just the affected cash, but the effect on liquidity. And that's where this practice of liquidity planning comes out. Treasury teams and even other finance teams um, like FPNA are looking at the same time horizons. They're looking further out. FPNA is sometimes coming from two or three years and then coming downstream. Treasury taking their bottoms up approach and pushing upwards. But they're surrounding those forecasts with additional data and analytics to understand what's the impact of this scenario and that scenario on our cash and our ability to raise cash to drive growth or to protect the balance sheet or any number of outcomes that typically involve borrowing, investing, and leveraging your working capital. There's a lot more intention around managing those programs. Liquidity planning is about harnessing all of that data and analytics and making your forecast actionable. So from a platform standpoint, we just provided the toys that they can all do that uh, as automatically as possible. But the practice is evolved so that forecasting is only a step in the pathway. It's no longer the end point. Yeah, yeah I like your quote in the article, um, forecasting has changed. CFOs must plan liquidity and free cash flow against multiple risk scenarios and, and they demand data and analytics. I think that, I think that captures so much of the issue. And it's, that's a culmination of multiple years of forecasting is really important. We would spend more time on it if we did had. We, we don't have enough time to do it. We're going to spend more on doing it. Um, and the idea of you know risk increasing and the need to do a better job. It's more scenarios, more data, more automation in an area that's that's far more important. Uh, you know, very timely. Very interesting insights. Thank you, Bob and Craig, for your time and valuable insights. We would also like to thank our CTM file audience for joining us on this edition of Open Treasury. Please subscribe and look in the show notes for the article links. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. 
For more information, visit ctmfile.com.